My name's Brennan, and I work here as the student ministry resident. Ben doesn't know my title, even though he's my boss. And what I do is I, proven by the slide, uh, what I do is I work with middle school, high school, college, and young adults. So tonight I get to be with you guys on Wednesdays. I get to hang out with the youth, and I love my job. I absolutely love it. When I graduated from SDSU in May, so yes, I am an SDSU grad, go Jacks. I graduated with economics and communication studies. And about halfway through my degree, I realized that I didn't really like econ and speech was just easy. So I, I took my degrees, I graduated, and now I'm actually doing what I want to do. So in January, I'm going to start seminary. And then the last thing you guys need to know about me is I'm married. So they have a picture of me and my wife. Thank you. I like her too. And as I continue, as I continue to speak, um, try not to get distracted by the bling. But yeah, I'm married. I love Jesus. And I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight. And that's really all you need to know about me. The topic of tonight is, yes, we're, consider, we're continuing in this series called Learn to Live, where we look at this guy named Elijah. We focus on his life and different things he does. But on your note card, it says the title is Turning Back Again. And I decided to talk about this right off the bat because I want to give you guys what tonight is about. God, the God we worship, is in the business of redeeming broken people. He's in the business of calling the lost home. He's in the business of turning people back again. So we're going to continue to look at that tonight, but I need to recap what we talked about last week. It was a three-day weekend, and we had... 1% of the people who are currently in here, and we love that you guys are all here, but we need to recap because Ben taught this amazing message about what it looks like to live simple, humble, obedient lives. And it was this, and he talked about suspending reason, that sometimes it's not going to make sense at all what God's asking you to do, but you just need to step into it. Then he talked about surrendering pride. When we need help, when we need God to move in situations, we've got to lay our pride down. And then lastly, he talked about serving faithfully that there's going to be things that you need to step into, that you need to do that God is asking, and you just have to step in and faithfully serve. And with that, we can jump into tonight. We're taking it in a different area. We're still looking at Elijah. But I have to tell you this other story first, because truth be told, I was looking on how to start a sermon, because I'm a speech major, so you got to have an intro. And when I was Googling things, I found this story. And the story simply goes like this. There is a 30-year-old businessman from Russia whose name is Alexei Baikov. And Alexei had this girlfriend, Namarita Kolikov. And these two had been dating for a long time. And them, like me, believe you should date with a purpose. And if you guys want to know more about that, come in February after the Ask Us Anything. We're going to do a relationship series. But you should date with a purpose. So they'd been together for a, a period of years. And they thought, you know, we should probably pursue marriage. You know, it's, it's something, we're 30, it, it's been a while, we've been together, we're happy, this is a healthy relationship, kind of, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and Alexi is kind of like some of us. He thought if he needed to propose to his girlfriend at the time, he needed to do it in this elaborate, crazy way. He's wealthy. So, he prepared this thing, we'll call it, where he invited his girlfriend to meet him in front of their favorite restaurant on one of the busy intersection corners. And when she showed up to what she thought was just a normal date, because she didn't know what was going on, she didn't find Alexi standing there holding flowers or candy or something. What she found was a multiple car pileup. Cars on their side, all damaged, smoke, ambulances, police officers running around in the craziness of this busy intersection where there had been an ar- a car accident. And as she's watching in dismay what's happened at this intersection, she sees Alexi, her boyfriend, the love of her life, being carried by paramedics on a stretcher over to the ambulance. And of course, she runs and she goes and she goes to the paramedics and she demands to know what's happening to Alexi. And they turn to her and they and they tell her Alexi had passed away. And she, in that moment, realized she'd lost the love of her life, her future husband, her boyfriend. In her case, she thought everything. And she turned around and she started to walk away, and at that exact moment, Alexi sat up off the stretcher. He sat up and he grabbed a balloon 
And he grabbed the ring and he pursued his girlfriend. And after he tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and almost knocked him out, he did some convincing and honestly some begging. And then he got down on one dusty knee and asked her to be his wife. And she said yes. And the reason I don't think it's healthy is because he wanted to prove to her through his death that she was the only, he was the only way that she could ever have happiness in life. But weird. But they got married and it took Alexi a film director, a screenwriter, multiple stuntmen, and a crew of makeup artists to pull this off. He hired all of these people. He closed down an intersection. He did all of this. Why? Because he believed in the cause. He believed that she loved him and he loved her and they wanted to get married. And tonight, we're looking at a story of Elijah, where I believe Elijah believes in a call, so then he does something crazy. So if you have a Bible, you can open it to 1 Kings 18. Otherwise, they're going to put it up on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, you've never had a Bible, you left it at home, we have free Bibles here for you. So it's out in foyer. It's around the corner. It's the next steps table. That's my only plug. I'll get back into it. So we're going to pick it up in verse 16, but I need to give you a summary of the first 15. The 15 verses before this and a little bit even before that, we're introduced to a couple characters, one being Obadiah, who's this faithful servant to God and the other one being King Ahab. Ahab is described to be probably the worst king in all of Israel history. He was terrible. He didn't serve God faithfully at all. He consistently pursued other gods, which is God's least favorite thing. And Elijah, being a faithful prophet of God, wasn't liked by the king. So what did, what did he do? He decided to persecute Elijah and all the other Christians. So at this point in the story, Elijah's been on the run for his life. I mean, he hasn't had a moment of peace in who knows how long as this king is trying to kill him. So he runs into Obadiah and he asks Obadiah to arrange a meeting because Obadiah is the servant of the king. So he arranges this meeting and then we'll pick it up in verse 16. It says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to, to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jeze Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets yet left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls, get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of your bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, Baal, answer us. But there was no response. No one answered and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, shout louder, surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and needs to be awakened. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice, but there was no response, no one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one from each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, enough to hold two sehas worth of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull, and then he fill, said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trenches. 
at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped before, forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink For there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew dark with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Pray with me. Father, tonight, as we've opened up this giant chunk of text, that you would just speak so clearly to each and every person here exactly what you need them to hear. Let it be your words that flow from my mouth. Open up their hearts, break down walls. In Jesus' name, amen. So out of these 30 verses, I have picked five points to cover. I know you probably want three because three is that nice number, but I whittled it down to five and you can be thankful I got to five. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take steps through each of these five points. And as we walk through them, if we learn these and practice them, and master them, and live these in our lives, guys, the possibilities are endless for the crazy thing God wants to do with us. So the first one is this. We have to return to God. In verse 21, it says, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And I think we read something like this, And our minds instantly jump to the second sentence. Why? Because that's where the answers are. When you take a test, you read the question, but really you just want to see what your choices are. How many of these can I narrow out because they're obviously wrong and then I can guess and hopefully it's 50%. And when we look at this, we want the answers. But tonight, I don't think we could probably split the room and go, this half is following the Lord and that half is following Baal. It's just not a reality that we struggle with really anymore. In some parts of the world, maybe, but not really here. But what if we focus on the first part of the question? How long will you waver between two opinions? Because if we put the Lord on this side and your relationships over here, or wait, 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 we put the Lord on this side and your social activities over here, or we put the Lord on this side and the things you do in your private time over here, I think we're getting a little bit too close to home. Because Elijah's probing this question, yeah, Lord versus Baal, but really he's probing the question, Lord versus who? Who in your life, what in your life is distracting you from the Lord? And there's this story, it's supposedly a true story, of an atheist who had a dream. And yes, I'm going to tell a story about an atheist, so please let me finish before you mob the stage. But there's this atheist who had a dream, and he wakes up in the dream, and there's this giant valley sitting in front of him. And down the middle of the valley, about two feet wide, is a wall. And on one side of the wall, there are thousands of people, thousands, and one person that the atheist knows to be their leader. Just by standing there, he knows it. And he describes him in his dream is that's got to be Jesus. I mean, this is an atheist, and he said it was Jesus. But then he looks to the other side of the wall. And on the other side of the wall, there's thousands of people and one person who's supposed to be their leader. And the atheist recognizes this person to be Satan. And no, he didn't have a pitchfork or pointy ears or a red face, but he did look 
like what we would describe as worldly attractiveness, something our flesh would be desiring. That's how he describes it. And in the dream, he says that he knew he had to pick between the two sides. But the man's an atheist. So he does what any common sense person would do in his stance. He steps right up onto the wall where he can perfectly stand, and that's what he chooses. And all the people disappear. Everybody in the valley goes away. And him, thinking they didn't exist in the first place, is happy with his decision. And after a couple seconds, the devil reappears on his right. And the atheist, whoa, 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 whoa. I certainly, I didn't pick Jesus, but I certainly did not pick you. I certainly did not pick you. And the devil says, silly man. Silly man. Yeah, I own this side. But guess what? I own the wall too. So when we're looking at a question like this, where Elijah is probing us, God versus who, some of us are fully on God's side. Tonight we are full bore chasing after what God has for us. And some of us are living in sin. But there's also some of us stuck in that middle ground where we are the people Elijah is describing as wavering between two opinions. In the middle ground, the middle ground is always the evils. So we need to return to God. That's step one. I mean, if, if you haven't done that yet, if you haven't turned to God, you don't need the rest of the message. You need the first part. But some of us need the rest of the four points. So let's continue. Point two, rest assured. Rest assured. In verse 22 through 24, we see Elijah stand in front of this group of people. And we know precisely how many prophets are there. 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. But then it also describes that there are all, that the king had invited all of Israel. So for all we know, there are thousands upon thousands of people on the top of this mountain watching this event that's about to occur. And Elijah stands in the face of all of them and declares, I am the only prophet of the Lord left. Definitely not the prophet. The other prophets of the other gods are definitely not on his side. But all those people who are in the middle ground who he just called out, they're probably not on his side either. So he stands in front of thousands of people with the odds stacked against him. And he rests assured in God. You want to know how I know he rests assured in God? Because look what he does. He lets them choose first. Now, you might be thinking, in a competition, sometimes it's better to go second. And I'd agree with you. Like, let's take bowling for an example, because... I'm an average bowler, and I can talk about it sometimes. So we've got bowling, no bumpers for sure. You've got bowling, and say the competition is whoever knocks down the most pins. If that's it, I'm going second, because if you bowl first, then you're half decent and get six pins. I now know I need seven or more pins. That's an advantage to me, because I know how well I have to perform. But what if the competition is this? Whoever knocks down the first pin wins just change the game. Because that first person, all they have to do is hit one pin and the whole competition is over. That's the situation Elijah's in. He just set up this challenge where he said, Whoever call, whatever God calls down fire, they're God. So imagine he has the audacity to let them go first, the confidence to let them go first. And what if Baal responds? What if Baal calls down fire and it consumes their sacrifice? Elijah doesn't even get a chance to go. He simply loses without going. So he has confidence enough to stand there in front of thousands of people and say, I know my God, you go first. And I think we can know why he has that confidence too. Elijah knows God's word and he knows his voice. At this time period that we're reading, it had not rained in Israel for three years. I know we probably have some farmers in here. If it doesn't rain for three years, that's, that's tough. These people, most of them would have worked on land or different things like that, if, if not for sure, their food. So they're in the, the middle of this drought. And Elijah knows why. Because in Deuteronomy 11, verses 16 and 17, it says this. It says, be careful or you, you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and it will shut up the heavens so that no rain will come and the ground will yield no produce. So Elijah being a prophet, a faithful man of God, knows this text. And he knows it hasn't rained. So he knows God's upset with all of the people he stands before. But also he knows God's voice and he knows that God's given him a mission. And he actually declared chapters earlier that it wouldn't rain until he 
spoke. He spoke. That's the confidence that he has because he knows God's word and he knows his voice. But then he puts the cherry on top. Now, I'm no Boy Scout, not a, definitely not an Eagle Scout, and I went backpacking last two summers ago with a couple buddies, and I was one of five. And out of those five, I guarantee you the other four thought I was going to be a pain in the butt the whole time. I would rather be clean and organized, and I would rather look half decent and shower every single day. I don't want to be in the dirt. I don't want, definitely don't want no bugs. And I don't want any of that stuff. But I went on the backpacking trip, and I survived, and it was a great time. But I do know this, that when you are trying to light something on fire, oh, don't pour water on it. Don't pour water on it. And Elijah stands there, and he says, all right, do it. Four large jugs, do it. Eh, do it again. Eh, third time, do it again. And he pours these water and the water, and it fills the trough, and everything's wet. And these thousands of people standing there watching, <laughs> they're trying to survive in three years of a drought. Their animals, their crops, them themselves need this water, and he just took a ton of it and dumped it on the ground. He slapped him in the face. He said, my God, I am so confident in who my God is and why I'm here that I will dump water on my sacrifice to prove that it's now trickery. This is all God. So when we return to God and we've rest assured in God, we're now ready to step into the challenge. So the third point is this, you have to rebuke the bad. Whenever we're fighting in a challenge or there's competition, our best strategy is to know the other person's strategy. In Battleship, if you knew where everybody's boats were, you'd win. It's the same thing with the text here. We have three ways that the evil is going to work in this text. And I believe the three ways that evil works are the same way that evil works in our lives. And the first one is this, in verse 26, evil is persistent. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. From morning until noon. Actually, they end up worshiping all the way from morning until the evening sacrifice. Sometimes I wish we had faith like that. But they worship all day and they never give up and it's persistent. So those things, maybe I was poking at earlier that I hope you recognize in yourself that maybe aren't of God, those things, they don't go away on their own. They're staying there. They're persistent, but they're also aggressive. In verse 28, it says this, and as they shouted louder, they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. So sometimes we think, okay, I know the sin's not going away, but I mean, is it hurting me? I think it's just this silly law that God gave us. I mean, why does it matter what I'm doing? But it's this fact is that Sin is persistent but also aggressive and it seeks to harm you. It seeks to harm itself. It will do anything possible to have you, anything. And then there's this third point that evil seeks to attack your faith. In verse 30, we see it like this. Elijah summons the people to him and they came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. So as these people worshiped all day and danced around and prophesied and cut themselves and screamed and danced, they had destroyed the Lord's altar on that mountain. And Elijah must repair it before he can do his sacrifice. And those things that are persistent and aggressive in your life, if you let them stay, they're attacking your faith. They want your faith to die. They want it to go away. They want everything possible. It wants everything possible for your faith to go sour. So as we look at the three ways that evil's working in this story and evil's working in our lives, as we recognize the strategy of who we're against, we can better respond. And I pray that we'd respond like Elijah does. Because in verse 27, or 25 and 27, <laughs> he does something I'd call crazy. Thousands of people who are all opposing him, and he says this stuff. Choose your bull and prepare it, since there are so many of you, Shout louder. Surely he is a God. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. Maybe he's busy in thought. Maybe he's traveling. <laughs> Elijah's standing there in front of thousands of people and he is clowning on those people. He's straight smack talking them right to their face. 
And when I read this story and I read this story and I read this story, I didn't get it. It just seems arrogant. And yeah, he's got confidence, but come on, man. But I think he does it for this point. Is when we're up against things, up against evil things, dealing with sin in our life, we must rebuke the bad. We have to take away the power that we've given it in our lives. That pornography addiction that you think rules you, it doesn't. It's nothing. It's sleeping. It's dumb. It doesn't have the power. That thing you keep doing that you can't get away from and you go back to it and back to it and back to it and back to it and you beg the Lord and you go back to it and back to it. Rebuke it. Say it doesn't have that power over you. You must speak it out as Elijah does. Say in the face of what you're facing, it doesn't rule over you. It doesn't have power over you. It'll never beat you. And you do that because you rest assured in who God is. And then he does what I would describe as another crazy thing. Because in verse 40, he's just performed this miracle and defeated all of these prophets. And he tells the people there to grab them and he brings them down into the valley. And a nice way to put it is he kills them. (laughs) But no, the text puts it as he slaughters them as if they were dirty animals. He slaughters them. And again, I read it and I read it and I was like, it doesn't make sense. Why, God? But I think it's this. When we've defeated a sin, when we've overcome something in our life that's behind us now, don't let it stay around. Those things that you've you've finally gotten past, you've defeated it, the Lord has granted you grace to overcome it. Kill it, lay it in the grave, never let it come back. And this is how we respond to the ways of evil. And we do the first three points because of point four. Remember the cause. Remember the cause. I think when you look at Elijah's prayer in 36 and 37, and I'll read it to you, but it says this, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are Lord, our God, and you are turning their hearts back again. He doesn't say one thing about fire or sacrifice or the obstacles that are in front of him. He doesn't mention the prophets. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He simply asks God to turn hearts back again. We got to remember the cause. God is in the business of redeeming the broken, of bringing the lost home, of healing the the hurting. That's our God. He's always about that, always about that. And as we begin to pray those things, as we stand and look at the face of the things, I mean, your school, your family issues, your friend group issues, I can keep your personal issues. (laughs) I don't think anybody wants me to keep going, but I could. And as we stand and we look at those things, Do we have confidence, do we have the boldness to do the crazy thing and pray that hearts would be turned back to God? He doesn't mention anything about his obstacle, nothing. He simply prays what God's about. So can we pray like that? But then he does this other thing in verses 30 and 40. In 30, he says, come to me. He says it to all the people there. Come to me, and they came to him. And then in 40, he has them participate in the slaughter. And he does these things because God doesn't work in darkness. He doesn't work behind closed doors. He works out in the open because he wants people's hearts to turn back again. Elijah invites thousands of people to come and to see what the Lord's going to do because God is in the business of turning hearts back again. So can we be the same thing that God's doing? And then the last one is this point five catch-all. And I promise I'll wrap up. But it's repeat the race. It's repeat the race because Elijah does this crazy thing. Calls down fire from heaven. Consumes an entire altar. And if that's me, (laughs) two thumbs up for Brennan. I'm going to go chill. I'm going to go hang out. I'm not doing nothing the rest of the day. Come on, that's a good day's work right there. What does Elijah do? He climbs back up the mountain, puts his face between his knees on the ground in this posture of humility. Because again, if that's me, 
I just did a good thing. You mean, come on, Lord, look at what I did. But Elijah, no, puts his face on the ground because he knows that was God. That was nothing to do with him. He was simply a vessel. And he does this in a state of humility and he asks God for rain. It hasn't rained for three years and Elijah says, do more. And it's, it's a simple fact that as we see God respond and do these crazy things, it spurs us to go and do more crazy things. So let me put this precursor out there. If you're not interested in seeing God move in mighty ways, don't start. <laughs> don't start because if he moves once, oh, that is an addiction that will continue and continue and continue because we cannot stop seeing God work in amazing ways. But then... <laughs> I mean, the story's not over. Come on, Elijah, he's had this day. He puts his face on the ground. He, he, he goes into this posture of humility and humbleness and he asks the Lord to bring the rain. And again, the way I work is, I mean, <laughs> he prayed, he asked God. The servant came back and said, no. I mean, I tried, <laughs> right? We tried. We tried to do this thing. We, we, we were attempting to be faithful. I mean, we just saw God. Elijah only prays once and fire falls from heaven. So, I mean, you did it this way before. Why am I sitting here praying again and you're not responding? You, there's a formula, isn't there, God? Isn't this how you work? Step A, step B, step... But he says, no, go back, go back, go back. He sends him seven times to the cliff to look over the edge. And after seven times of faithfully praying, seven times of sending a servant saying, go back, turn hearts back again, go back. A small cloud the size of a man's hand rises off the coastline. And Elijah sends the servant to go chase down the king and tell him the good news. And then God does what God does the whole sky turns black. There's a mighty rain, rushing winds, a consuming black sky, the same way God showed up. And he doesn't just take the meat off the altar. He takes the stone. He takes the water. He takes the wood. God consumes all. God will show up and do amazing things. He's not just a one small cloud kind of God. God is a consume all black sky, heavy rain God. That's the God we worship. And then we get this tidbit at the end that I, I don't even, <laughs> Elijah has performed these two miracles. And it says in verse 46, the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran all the way, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So I'm nerdy sometimes and I looked up the distance between Mount Carmel and Jezreel. 27 miles. This dude got off the mountain, climbed down, and ran 27 miles ahead of the king in his chariot. <laughs> this dude just did two miracles. He was crazy because he believed in the cause, and he gets off the mountain, and he runs faster than a couple of horses for an entire marathon. Oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. But this is why it's here. It's because the power of the Lord came on Elijah. The same power of the Lord that if you call in the name of Jesus fills you. Now, I don't think anybody here needs to go run a marathon faster than a horse. But I do think these four points I just gave you, including the fifth one, repeat the race. I think we need the power of the Lord upon us and in us to complete those things not in our own strength, not by anything we have, but only to the glory of God. I cannot stand up here and present you with this text without the presence of God. It's just words if I don't invite God into it. He gives us his spirit, his power, his goodness, his presence. And he says, run, go, repeat the race, rebuke the bad, remember the cause, rest assured, return to God. And out of all of that, we have an application point because I want to be a pastor and I need to give you an application point. And it's simply this. Boldly ask God to move in our lives and turn hearts back again. Ezekiel thirty six twenty six says, I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God wants to give 
all of us, every person we encounter, relationship with him that starts with our hearts. Turn hearts back again. We all have people in our lives that need to turn back again. So let's boldly ask God to move. Pray with me. Father, thank you tonight for the story of Elijah. Thank you tonight that you work in crazy miracle ways. Thank you tonight that you give us boldness and courage that if we can stand up and declare the cause, you will work and you will move and you will do mighty things. So as we go this week and as we continue to step into our daily lives, will you give us purpose? Will you give us that cause at the forefront of our mind that you are turning hearts around? Father, tonight, I believe there are people in here who for the first time need their heart turned. And what that means is simply God's asking you this. Will you repent of your sin and come back to him and declare Jesus as your, your Lord and your Savior? Repent in that word is simply to turn. God's asking to turn your heart around. And we sometimes here at Oasis give you this opportunity to respond to what God's doing in your life. And we do it not for us. Man, none of you could ever raise your hand and we will still praise God, but we do it for you. Because when that hand goes up in the air and you physically respond to what God's already doing on the inside, it just makes it more real to you. So on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if this is the first time your heart's been turned to God if you've decided to accept the Lord Jesus as your savior. One, two, three. Father, we praise you. We praise you. <laughs> Thank you for tonight. Thank you for Elijah. Thank you for Jesus. For Jesus who went to the cross and died for our sin that we may no longer work or fight or struggle to reach you and to be in relationship with you, but Jesus has done all the work and we simply say yes. Thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.